often when I'm looking at my computer screen and watching the beautiful images unfolding. I'm reminded of Keats's famous lines, charmed at magic casements opening on the foam of perilous seas in fairy lands forlorn. The Mandelbrot set is indeed one of the most astonishing discoveries in the entire history of mathematics. Who could have dreamed that such an incredibly simple equation could have generated images of literally infinite complexity? We've all read stories about maps that revealed the location of some hidden treasure. Well, in this case, the map is the treasure. So the Mendelbrot set. This is a topic I've been looking into with increasing interest for some time now. And I've, I've kind of always been fascinated by the whole fractal geometry thing. And of course, even the little shell logo that I've been using for my channel is in a way kind of a nod to the whole idea of, of fractals being found in nature and how this is a sign of intelligent design in the creation and so on. So naturally, the, the Mendelbrot set would be something that I would find extremely interesting. But it's actually gotten a lot more interesting the more I've been looking into, of course, all these connections between Copernican cosmology and the correlations between mysticism, occultism, and pantheism, and so on. Especially since I just did uh, the video on the solar system being a construct of Kabbalah, and I've also done several videos talking about atomism and how that is derived from ancient occultism, the Greek and Indian mystery schools, and uh, hermeticism, and so on, and how this relates to this Mendelbrot effect idea and the cosmological connections there with the idea of the micro reflecting the macro, you know, with the alleged model of the atom supposedly, you know, reflecting the alleged model of the solar system, reflecting the alleged model of the galaxy, and so on and so forth. So I was kind of ruminating on all these ideas, and then I came across this. The universe is alive. Have you ever given any thought to where humanity came from? Why we are here? And on what mission? Most people are convinced that it's all due to evolution which turned apes into humans. The rest assume the ape itself could hardly appear out of nowhere. Its creation had at least to be facilitated by some sort of authority figure, the creator. There are quite a few theories of human origin, and all of them can turn out far from being true. Why is that? The thing is, humans strive to identify themselves as the crown of creation without considering the actual possibility of being just a tiny piece of nature. In that case, can our infinite universe be a cell of one gigantic living organism? Let's go back to school, to a physics class. It will remind us that a cell is made up of molecules. A molecule consists of atoms, and atoms are composed of the nucleus and electrons which revolve around the nucleus. In the context of the universe, the planets represent electrons. The sun can be viewed as the nucleus in the atom, the atom being our solar system. And if we dig deeper, we'll see the galaxy as a molecule and our entire universe a cell. From an even broader perspective, there's a multitude of universes just like cells in a human body. They come in infinite numbers. At a certain time, all of them are created, exist for a while, and then are doomed to destruction, which is confirmed by ancient Vedic scriptures. Doesn't it remind you of the life of a cell, its creation, life, and death? Recent research conducted by means of NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope revealed a stellar system made up of two intertwined chains, just like a double helix in a DNA molecule. The system is 80 light years in length. Intriguing, isn't it? But that's just the start. According to a study published in Nature's Scientific Reports, the universe can grow just like a gigantic brain, with the electrical firing between brain cells mirrored by the shape of expanding galaxies. It turns out that natural growth dynamics, or the way the systems evolve, are the same for various types of networks, be it the internet, human brain, or the universe on the whole. 
That leads scientists to believe that the universe does grow like a brain. Based on the above, it is logical to conclude that the universe is not a mechanism, but something much bigger. It is alive not just in its small elements, organic substance, biological bodies, biological communities, and the biosphere of the planets, but as a whole. All the small and big elements in it are closely interrelated and interdependent. Clearly, this can't be proved by purely scientific data that exists today. Taking the universe to the scientific laboratory and experimenting with it is beyond our human capacity. But let's list the major arguments in favor of this theory. Number one, the idea that the universe, the cosmos, is alive was voiced by outstanding 20th century thinkers. At the dawn of the space era, K. E. Tsiolkovsky wrote his book, The Living Universe. It states that all bodies are sensitive, or more precisely, irritable, responsive to a greater or lesser degree. Dead bodies, to a lesser degree, living bodies, to a greater degree. It actually points to the fact that everything existing in the universe can be considered a living body or its part. Therefore, the universe as a whole can be regarded as a living organism. Number two, oriental spiritual teachings, as well as famous mystics and spiritual gurus, also view the entire universe as a living being, some living structure, or in other words, the living cosmos. Who knows how close to or far from the truth are all the theories above. Nevertheless, why can't we hope to look in the face of the supreme mind one day and discover it to be the living universe? So, of course, I saw that and was just blown away because the Copernican pantheism is just being shoved in your face, right? And especially everything that they say at the end there, talking about uh, Eastern mysticism and even mentions Tsiolkovsky, which I've talked about in a video a while back, getting into the idea of Russian cosmism. And Tsiolkovsky was basically considered the, the father of, of modern space travel, but he was a mystic. He was a cosmist, which amazingly enough sort of embodied the... Uh, the ideology of transhumanism long before it was even sort of a concept that had to do with um, computers and technology. It was just in a very raw spiritual sense, but it had to do with becoming one with the cosmos, one with the universe. It's again, it's pantheistic and it's just fascinating how all these things uh, kind of connect back to each other again and again. But speaking of mysticism and occultism, check this out. Here's another strange resonance. This series of paintings was made in 1928 by a patient of Carl Gustav Jung, the co-founder of modern psychology. Jung would have been surprised and delighted to know that the computer revolution, whose beginning he just lived to see, would give new impetus to his theory of the collective unconscious. The idea that there is a well of consciousness compounded of primordial universal images that we all share, the substructure or background of awareness. The mind clearly finds resonances in the M set, but there are other wider implications too. This mathematics offers new insights into the way the universe works, how much in life is determined and how much is due to chance. When Isaac Newton came up with laws of motion and laws of gravity, the picture that emerged was of a clockwork universe. It was of a, a machine that ticked on a predetermined course. And we needed to know was where it was now and what it was doing now, and then you could predict the future forever. And there are two challenges to this. One is quantum mechanics, which says, in fact, there is irreducible chance built into the very fabric of the universe. And you can't actually say exactly what it's doing now, you can't say exactly what it's doing ever. But the other is things that come out of the Mandelbrot set and related parts of mathematics, which is even in a Newtonian world, in practice you may not be able to predict the future. It can be deterministic in principle, but not in practice. This is how God created a system which gave us free will. It's the most brilliant maneuver in the universe to create 
something in which everything is free. How could you do that? Albert Einstein refused to accept the idea of a dice-playing deity. He, he wrote a letter to Max Born in which he said, you believe in a god who plays dice and I in complete law and order. So he obviously felt that chance and deterministic laws were not compatible and he preferred the deterministic laws. Now what the Mandelbrot set and chaos and related things have done for us is to show that you can have both at the same time. So it's, it's not whether God plays dice that matters, it's how God plays dice. I can tell you, exploring this set, I certainly never had the feeling of invention. I had never the feeling that my imagination was rich enough to invent all these extraordinary things. I was discovering them. They were there, even though nobody had seen them before. It's marvelous. A very simple formula explains all these very complicated things. So the goal of science is starting with mess to explain by a simple formula. This is the kind of dream of science. And in this case, the dream is implemented in a fantastic fashion. Now it gets even better because what I also stumbled across in this research was a presentation by my good buddy, Dr. Jason Lyle, everyone's uh, favorite creationist Copernican astronomer. And he actually has a whole presentation talking about the Mandelbrot set, and it's actually called The Secret Code of Creation, Fractals. And if you want a good breakdown of exactly what the Mandelbrot set is, well, it's basically this very simple mathematical formula that is that once plotted by computers forms this crazy, presumably infinitely complex pattern. You know, the beginning part of this presentation is actually a pretty good explanation of that. But what gets really interesting is then, of course, his take on the Mandelbrot set and how he's proposing that this is, of course, evidence of a biblical god because it's like a code that has been built into numbers itself. And he actually says that mathematics is the language of God, and so therefore, you know, no human could have come up with this. So therefore, it must have just been implanted in numbers itself by God, you know, so that we would stumble across it one day once we had the computing power to do so. Which, once again, I think sort of points back to many of the underlying sort of philosophical shortcomings of so much of mainstream Christianity and modern creationism. Because really, again, I think it reveals a, a sort of naivete. I mean, in this presentation alone, it, again and again, he, he makes references to, you know, the, the secularists, the atheists. And as if that's what the whole conversation between creation versus evolution centers around. And the idea of the idea that there is something beyond secularism at work here. Um, is just completely left out of the picture. And overall, I just find it very peculiar to think that, I mean, because when you really look into how supposedly the, the Mandelbrot set was discovered, and it wasn't until 1980, but it's this very simple equation. You, you run any number through it, and, and so then it either retains it as part of the set or rejects it uh, from the set. And then if you plot enough of these numbers in the set, you get this picture starting out with the bug, and then if you continue plotting and continue zooming in, which of course, you, it, the whole point is that it re requires a computer. So without the computer plotting millions of these numbers in the set, you have no way of knowing that there even is any significance or that there is even a pattern in the first place, thus you would never know that this formula really had significance. You know, so it's kind of this weird chicken and the egg thing. Like, how do they know to plug this into the computer? And, and you know, it was, oh, it's just this, oh, we just stumbled across it. But then you have to wonder why, why is Arthur C. Clarke, why is, you know, Terrence McKenna and all these New Ager guys, why are they always talking about fractal geometry? Because really this is the, the really this is the key to how I think they're trying to explain pantheistic evolution the self-organizing nature of the universe. You know, modern creationists continually is just making this argument that, you know, science comes from the Bible and science is based on a Christian worldview because only a god would, would create scientific laws to the universe. Well, they don't really understand that Eastern philosophy and, and mysticism doesn't reject the idea of laws. It actually deifies the idea of, of laws. The laws, the scientific laws, sort of our God, are the mind of God. The mathematics are our God. And we're all part of it. It's in us. It's in everything. So again, it just makes me think that you're, we're just looking at another example of just like going back even to Newton, thinking that, oh, I'm, you know, taking concepts that arrive from dubious sources, they don't come from the bottom, <laughs> trying to, just trying to take anything, and, oh, it's math, so it must be of God. This must be proof of God, without really realizing the, the deeper implications of it all.